Zachary Taylor is the curator and registrar of the Southampton History Museum. Um, he's been with us for almost a year now. Um, and in that time, he's kind of very quickly been thrust into uh, learning as much as he can about Southampton history. Um, he's from Farmingdale originally and got his master's degree from uh, Stony Brook University in art history and criticism. Um, and so he's been putting a lot of that uh, sort of intellectual work into figuring out about the history of all these whaling captains. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to him now. He's going to uh, start his lecture. And as I said before, if anybody has any questions throughout this talk, I know a few people have joined since I said it before, um, down at the bottom of the toolbar for Zoom, there is a Q&A button. Click that, it'll bring up a new little window where you can submit any questions you might have throughout the, throughout the talk. And Zach and I will be more than happy to answer them at the end. So now I'm gonna turn over to Zach and we can get started with the program. Hello and good morning, everybody. So let me get my screen share open. Uh, oh, that's, yes, uh, there I am right now. Um, as you can kind of infer, uh, both myself and Connor are standing uh, figuratively at different ends of the uh, Rogers Mansion right now, which um, will come into play as far as uh, one of the uh, subject matters um, going through this lecture. So anyway, um, just as a brief introduction, uh, this subject of this lecture, um, as implied leading up to today, uh, will be on whaling captains living primarily uh, on Main Street in Southampton, once formerly known as Captain's Row. Uh, when bringing forth a discussion on whaling captains, both on Main Street and in Southampton uh, in general, uh, it's important to recognize uh, the history that operates as a framework in which these captains lived and where they stood in history of Southampton. Uh, as such a discussion on the Southampton History Museum itself, its dedication to preservation of Southampton history, the properties it owns and their own history are also vital to this discussion, um, as well as a lot of history that goes into prior to the uh, English settlers coming to uh, Long Island and also the burgeoning industries that would evolve uh, throughout the 19th century, um, not only just across America, but also hitting uh, Long Island and New York and the surrounding East Coast uh, as well. So, oh, I've just been informed that my screen is not sharing. Uh, my apologies for that. Uh, yes, there we go. So let's go into full screen right here. As you can see, um, the title of this lecture is Captain's Row, uh, Main Street of Southampton. So then, we will start with the uh, with the properties that we uh, own that relate to this lecture. We'll start with the Rogers Mansion, um, where we find ourselves uh, figuratively uh, right now. Um, the Rogers Mansion is a Gilded Age mansion that stands on land that was awarded that was awarded to William Rogers in 1648 and remained with the Rogers family for eight generations. Uh, in 1889, the Rogers Mansion was then purchased by Dr. John Nugent from the three remaining children of Albert Rogers, uh, where his sons, William and Paul, would themselves uh, be born. In 1899, the house was then sold by Dr. Nugent to Samuel L. Parrish and remained with him until his death in 1932. Uh, 20 years later, uh, after this, it was restored and under the ownership of the Southampton History Museum and consists of furnishings dating back to the Victorian and Edwardian eras uh, thanks in part to numerous donations from community members uh, over the years. So this here we see is Conscious Point. Um, this is uh, regarded as the supposed landing location of settlers in the South Hampton area located in the North Sea Harbor. Um, in 1910, the Southampton History Museum had acquired the site um, where visitors can view this peaceful waterfront area featuring a 20 ton Boulder commemorating Southampton's founding and initial meeting with the Shinnecock with the volunteer run conscience point shellfish hatchery uh, shellfish, hatch, shellfish hatchers, I apologize for that, which supply over 1 million oyster seeds to nearby bays. Uh, how interconnected the Rogers Mansion is with whaling history throughout the 19th century uh, will also be further uh, explored as the two was on Main Street at the time, unlike where it stands right now, where it sits on Meeting House Lane, just a few hundred, a few hundred feet away, or about a hundred feet away from Main Street now. So, 
On the act of whaling itself, um, the process of whaling entails uh, the, process, the act of hunting whales for oil and food primarily. Um, a lot of methods and tactics of whaling have evolved alongside the technological advancements uh, that took place while whaling was, and in certain parts of the world still is, uh, a notable practice. Uh, whaling was once uh, commonplace across the world by nations and populations capable of seafaring, especially when the prospect of the whale being a limitless creature, limit, limitless creature, uh, excuse me, um, as it was perceived within the vastness of the oceans was once believed or indeed overestimated. The earliest uh, traces of whaling can be seen within artifacts from the Neolithic era. Um, and prior to the industrialization of the act of whaling, uh, the harvesting of whales meant the use of as many of its parts out of, out of necessity for survival more often than not. Alongside extracting the whale for food and fuel, their bones were also often fashioned uh, into necessary tools in relation to continued seafaring and whaling. So as far as early whaling in Southampton itself is concerned, um, uh, the most noted uh, earliest examples are the Paleo Indians slash the Shinnecock people whose uh, act of whaling dates back over 13,000 years um, when the Paleo Indians first arrived in this area. Um, at this point, uh, Native Americans hunted whales for their meat and material primarily, uh, long-standing traditions and heritage, heritage as whalers um, that they exercised, used dugout canoes to perform offshore whaling. And the act of whaling was for the sake of harvesting the sea for their own sustenance and dietary needs uh, primarily. Um, and as such, uh, the whales that were known as drift whales in particular were a valuable food supply for them. Uh, their own skills as whalers, albeit utilized for their own survival and heritage, uh, would then translate to European settlers after observing the Shinnecock uh, methods of whale harvesting. Uh, the settlers' use of whale blubber turned into oil and used for heating, lighting, and machine lubricants, as well as, in some rare cases, food as well. The massive industry that would follow on eastern Long Island, uh, as well as the New England area, uh, would just become uh, just overwhelming as whaling was developed into a capitalistic endeavor. Now, we see here a, one of the earliest maps of, one of what is known as Feversham. Uh, which existed uh, near the Sag Harbor area and became the third largest port in the colonies during the 17th century. Uh, however, it would then disappear some 100 years later, largely due to the size not capable of containing exactly how massive the whaling industry would become. Sea captains that were living in Southampton while would then, following this, sail out of Sag Harbor, uh, the most accessible area large enough to accommodate the volume of whaling captains and vessels uh, the, that Southampton would produce as time went on. From the Pearson scrapbook, uh, it, it says, the notice of the death of Captain Edward Halsey recalls to our mind the fact that within our remembrance, there were 39 whaling captains living in Southampton alone and their lives and adventures would make a work of this, make a work of this, of the greatest interest. So this is a map of Southampton circa 1858, I believe, or at the very least, this is a map of Southampton that has the most comprehensive uh, dotted uh, list and indication of all the whaling captains and most notable historic figures that existed in Southampton during this time. Uh, our primary focus will be uh, what is known as a uh, main street, uh, both then and in the present, uh, but then being also known as Captain's Row, of course. So that will be the primary focus of uh, our lecture today, with a few caveats uh, here and there as respective captains' names uh, come up. So in the words of uh, William S. Pelletreau, uh, in regards to his writing on captains in 1893, uh, he writes that it is safe to address almost any middle-aged man one might meet as captain while living on Main Street. Uh, following this, he would compile a list of old whaling captains and published uh, this list in an issue of the times as it existed then. Uh, once this was released, uh, this got old whalers thinking about a 
thinking and a number of other names have occurred to them, adding even further to the list of captains and family members of such captains. Uh, he would write this in regards to sea captains that were living in the 19th century within his own time, uh, William Pelletro would, on the strip of Main Street known as Captain's Row for its home of numerous whaling captains leading up to that point. And here we see the that same map just split uh, in half uh, and then put on both sides so that you get a little bit of a clearer picture uh, for those of you who have um, the capability of seeing uh, this on a large screen, such as a monitor or what have you. Uh, for the benefit of those, you see a little bit more of a detailed uh, examination of uh, certain names that existed here. So, and once again, we uh, are focusing on Main Street, so that'll be where a lot of our captains will be, will have occupied as time goes on. So then, um, actually, uh, before we uh, go to the uh, the primary uh, meat of the presentation, I have one more thing to add. The main focus of this lecture, of course, is on 19th century whaling captains, but it would be remiss to leave out the whaling captains that uh, came before these, as well as many of them were the descendants of 19th century captains themselves, uh, and also before moving forward, if there are any gaps in photographic or biographical documentation. Uh, this largely stems from a few key factors, unfortunately. Um, one being such that records were sparse, were sparse as far as what was recorded and indeed what could be preserved. Another factor would be cameras were either not invented as of yet, depending on the uh, time period in which these respective captains were living, uh, or indeed they were prohibitive uh, as far as cost is concerned uh, when they did exist. Um, and one final factor is being painting and portraiture uh, being rather expensive uh, during this time as well, with artistic renditions of such figures also sadly being scarce. Now, having said all that, we can move on to our key figures. Uh, we start with an honorable mention uh, in that of Pyrrhus Conser, um, who my coworker uh, Connor had given a very thorough and wonderful lecture on uh, just this time last week. So if you would like to know more about Pierce Concer, I believe uh, that lecture is uploaded onto our YouTube uh, channel. So you will be able to find infinitely more uh, information on Pierce in that lecture. However, I still bring him up because he was very integral to a lot of the history of Southampton whaling captains during his own lifetime. So. Pierce Concer himself, uh, born in 1814 and passed away in 1897. Uh, Pierce was born the son of two slaves in Southampton uh, and spent about five years at Cooper Hall, which is indicated here on the uh, dot marked one on the map that we see uh, before us. Uh, following this, he lived for about 15 years with Charles Pelletro on the corner of Toilsome Lane and South Main Street, uh, indicated uh, further south on uh, Main Street here on the dot marked number two. Not technically a captain himself, but he was, as I mentioned before, highly integral with whaling history in Southampton amongst other captains during his time. Um, and while we only have record of three separate outings on the seas uh, in which he partook amongst other captains he worked alongside, uh, it is believed that Captain, sorry, it is believed that Pierce had more outings than those recorded. So between the ages of 18 and 21, uh, Pierce had gained his freedom when he began whaling and set sail on the first voyage under Captain Edward Sayer. In 1843, he was then hired as a boat steerer and was with Captain Mercator Cooper aboard the Manhattan in search of whales. Uh, and he and the ship made history by sailing to Japan to return lost sailors. In the spring of 1845, uh, they were stopping at various islands in the Pacific Ocean in search of supplies. Uh, and while doing so, found 11 shipwrecked uh, Japanese sailors at, um, bear with me with the pronunciation, uh, Torishima, otherwise translated to Bird Island. Uh, en route to Japan, they also found 11 additional sailors uh, at sea in a heavily damaged and sinking boat, uh, supposedly in the aftermath of hitting a reef, as uh, indicated by the damage. This rescue was additionally dangerous due to Japanese due to Japan being a closed country at the time, exercising a foreign policy that was known as Sakoku, 
um, again, bear with me for, for pronunciation, that then translates to a uh, closed country, which was enacted to remove the possibility of religious or colonial inference in influence during the time, resulting in an isolationist policy regarding trade and relations um, prior to uh, the Manhattan uh, making its way towards Japan. And, a, and a, another American ship had previous to theirs was fired upon uh, the last time they tried to approach the country. Just to exercise, just to get a, get an example of exactly how dangerous the situation was from the get go. After meeting with uh, Mercator Cooper, the Japanese allowed him and the ship to enter Edo Bay, um, otherwise known as Tokyo Bay in the present. While earning goodwill for both America and Conser, he um, Pierce himself was one of the first African Americans the, Jap the Japanese had ever seen. Uh, following all of this encounter, the rescue of the sailors and making their way into the country um, and into the seas of the country, the emperor then thanked them for the return of the sailors, but however, had warned them never to come back again or they would be killed. So uh, in this accompanying photo that we see before us, uh, we see that uh, Pyrrhus, we, see, we can see Pyrrhus at the leftmost end of the boat, accompanied from left to right by John Henry Hildreth, uh, Charles Bennett, Edward Bennett, Sam Schreider, Henry Conklin, and Captain George White, all in the same vessel as uh, Pierce. This photo was part of the 250th anniversary of the founding of Southampton, New York in 1890. And here we see just a, an enhancement or as much of an enhancement as you could possibly get with a photo such as this. Uh, you see, um, you can see a closer shot of Pierce as he is at the leftmost end of the boat there. So in retirement, uh, Pierce would then get married and had, uh, he got married and he had children who sadly had passed away tragically during his lifetime. Um, while at the same time, he was running a ferry service on Lake Agawam and had a home on Pond Lane. Uh, if we go back a few slides on the map that we see indicated here, um, the dot that's marked next to number three is the uh, living space in which Conser had lived um, up to uh, the remaining years of his life. Pierce can be seen in this shot right here. It is, uh, it is believed that we can see Pyrrhus here on his cat boat, uh, which is known as a sailboat uh, with a single sail on one mast uh, on Lake Agawam itself, where he ferried parties back and forth from the village to the beach. Uh, this photo is regarded to be uh, the only one showing his boat in action. Pierce, uh, in his lifetime, Pierce was also heavily involved in the Presbyterian Church. Um, and at his death, he was hailed as, quote, one of the most respected residents of the village. And this particular monument that you see here uh, is located in the southwest corner of North End Cemetery and indicates both his own death on August 23rd, 1897, and the death of his wife, uh, which was March 10th, 1890. Now then, on to Austin Herrick, uh, born 1796 and passed in 1862. Austin Herrick himself was the son of William and Phoebe Pearson Herrick, and he is often referred to in published accounts as an esteemed whaling captain in his own right. Uh, records of his birth in 1796 and marriage in 1835, uh, respectively. Austin was known to have lived at 17 North Main Street, where he also ran his store. His house initially built by David Howell in 1750, but would then be occupied by British officers uh, during the American Revolution. How, uh, the house ownership after the revolution went to the Pelletro family, where Elias built the store that remained many years attached to the house. Um, within documents, including a letter and logbook with his signature, uh, with the timing of events that indicate that within the book, Historic Long Island, uh, there is numerous reference to Herrick himself. Um, Herrick himself, while on his voyage, uh, while on his voyage, uh, wrecked his vessel off the coast of Brazil, uh, which, follow, which was followed by a trek through the Brazilian forests, 
uh, into Rio de Janeiro, uh, stowing away on a ship to America and finally arriving uh, back at Southampton. After this, Austin had converted his house after his whaling shipwreck expedition, um, or rather he coveted his house, house I should say, uh, my apologies, um, where after this he would marry the initially uh, reluctant Mary uh, Jager upon returning. Um, and in one of his, uh, during his return after coming back from the, uh, his vessel being wrecked in Brazil, uh, another noted act of his was when he walked out of a sermon when the minister was preaching in defense of slavery. Um, and after Austin had walked out of the sermon, uh, not long after, the minister had then resigned. In his own lifetime, Austin uh, made 17 voyages in his life and returned to keep the store attached to his house. And here we see uh, what uh, the store known as Herrick's Hardware had looked like uh, in its earliest days. Um, which his descendants had started uh, on South, on uh, Main Street itself, uh, the location of which uh, is still exists to today. Um, so his son, Samuel Edward Herrick, uh, would become a prominent minister in Boston for many years while his daughter, Mary, remained at the old home. So on to Charles Howell. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of our whaling captains where his birth and his death are unfor unfortunately uh, not been recorded and as such are not known to any of us. Uh, but Captain Charles Howell himself had purchased the house on Main Street dating back to 1688, uh, indicated by the red dot as you see on the map there. Captain uh, Howell would then marry, uh, had then married uh, Mary Rogers in 1831, and he had a son, George Robert Howell, who was then born in 1833 who would then be raised there and become an esteemed New York Senate archivist. Um, later on, he would sell the south portion of his property to the Methodist Church in 1843, uh, which then culminated to the Howell House, later then being purchased by Richard Post and moved around the corner to 30 Wall Street. Now on to Captain Albert Rogers, otherwise known as the um, initial uh, owner of the Rogers Mansion. Once again, so bringing, uh, bringing us full circle to how the Rogers Mansion ties into all of this, of course. Uh, so, oh, I believe I, oh, yes, sorry. Shuffling my notes here, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so Captain Albert Rogers uh, was born in 1807 and died in 1854. Uh, he himself was the son of Herrick and Phoebe Sayer Rogers. Um, his first marriage was with Mary Halsey, who sadly died uh, very young. Uh, but then he would marry uh, Mary's sister, uh, Cordelia, and they went on to have three children, uh, all named Mary, Jeter, and Edwin. Um, in this painting that you see uh, before us, uh, the painting itself shows the fruits of his fortune between the telescope um, that you see in the foreground in his hands, of course, um, as well as the ship in the fore slash the ship in the background, respectively, as well, done by this painting, of course, being done by the New York City artist, Frederick R. Spencer. In the side, we see a painted rendition of Mary Halsey Rogers, his first wife, of course. And in the following uh, slide, we also have a photograph of Mary and, oh, not, it's, my apologies, um, documentation of Mary and her mother as well. So then, on to the Rogers Mansion itself. In 1843, he built his family home, which uh, through many shifts in ownership became the Southampton History Museum in which the family lived until 1899. Uh, in this photo in particular, uh, we see the Rogers Mansion as it was still on Main Street during the 1890s, with of course the red dot indicating where exactly it would stand uh, right at the corner of Main Street and Meeting House Lane, which uh, as we know now has been moved back uh, in the waning years. So. Oh, and in this uh, slide, we see a colorized postcard of the Rogers Mansion as it still did indeed exist on Main Street, technically. Um, you see it right on the right-hand uh, side, uh, right here, still with its, uh, in its uh, most like cube form, I would say, um, with, uh, if you look very closely, you can see the addition of the music room uh, just uh, below that, or indeed the space in which the music room would lay 
So as far as his voyages, his history, and the Rogers Mansion aftermath, uh, it begins with uh, his many whaling voyages where he sailed to the South Atlantic on the bark Nimrod, as well as the ship Camulus. Um, and in, uh, and in, the, uh, in the case of other Southampton residents, uh, they knew of Rogers as a good-hearted man and a generous friend, uh, yet he had a way of, uh, as they would describe, petty swearing, which seemed second nature to him. Like it would, like, in most accounts, uh, such swearing just flew right out of it and almost unconsciously, according to uh, some uh, noted residents uh, living during his time. Part of the Rogers family uh, that had been one of the part of the Rogers family had been one of the first settlers in the town of Southampton, uh, and indeed, Albert himself made a fortune in the whaling industry uh, during his lifetime. After his death in 1854, his wife Cordelia became the owner of the mansion until her own death in 1887, where the property where the property would be in the hands of their three children for a brief period of time. Which brings us to Jeter Rose Rogers, uh, who is of course uh, born in 1841, died in 1919. Uh, Jeter is the son of Captain Albert Rogers, who then later married. Harriet Peterson, who was the daughter of Captain Philetus Peterson, part of the, Jeter was part of the last generation of the Rogers family to live in the Rogers mansion itself. In July, 1888, he was hired to navigate a new steamship from New Bedford to Honolulu, the latter being where he remained on the steamer as first officer for an Arctic whaling expedition. Four months later, in November uh, the same year, the steamer was one of a fleet of Arctic whalers caught in the ice, but somehow miraculously capable of escaping. Uh, friends with, he was, Jeter was also friends with another whaling captain, uh, Hubert White. Uh, more detail on him will follow, of course, and often went eeling together in the winter uh, once the ice was thick enough to support the two. The both of these men were known as the most successful eelers on Long Island. As a matter of fact, in one account, uh, one expedition saw both men uh, filling their sacks within an hour uh, filled with eels, but failed to take into account uh, the extra weight of the frozen eels themselves once they had procured them. The ice then cracked, Jeter went in, and Hubert looked down to see Jeter still clutching his sack of eels, refusing to let go. Hubert then speared the sack to grab a hold of it, and they had both finally, uh, thankfully, returned to surface even in the face of Jeter's uh, very stubbornness, which um, by all accounts would have costed him his life. Jeter, alongside his two siblings, uh, were the eighth and final generation of his family to live at the Rogers Mansion. Uh, in 1889, the Rogers Mansion would later be purchased by Dr. John Nugent, uh, which I mentioned uh, towards the introduction of this lecture. Now, on to Francis Sayre, uh, born 1807, but unfortunately, record of his death uh, has not been uh, noted or recorded, rather. Um, Francis himself was born to Francis and Hannah Sayre. Um, sadly, uh, alongside his death date, no photographic records existed of Francis. However, the their home itself has been documented as it existed. And here you see the location of where the Sayer home uh, would have been indicated by the red dot, of course. So this photo shows the old Sayer home uh, erected in 1645 as a color reproduction with the postcard uh, itself done by Corwith, uh, Corwith Pharmacy of Southampton, uh, copyright 1911. Um, of course, this would be when the pharmacy itself had existed. And in the following image, uh, we see here the Sayer House is seen from the front, accompanied by the text, uh, the oldest English frame housing in the United States, still standing, um, for the time still standing, of course, uh, as it was still standing during the time in 1908. His, uh, so for the family history voyages in later years of Francis himself, uh, his father was one of the great great was the great great grandson of a founding father of Southampton uh, itself, uh, namely Thomas Sayer, uh, whose ancestors came from Leighton Buzzard, uh, Bedfordshire, England, around 1625, uh, while then later settling in Lynn, Massachusetts. And amongst the uh, pioneer Puritan settlers of Southampton in 1640, alongside them, 
Uh, Francis Sr. himself lived to be 82 years old and lived a life aiding in the development of the village alongside Hannah living to be 80 years old. At the age of uh, 16, Francis Jr. was an apprentice to Elias Coombs, the carpenter at 104 Fulton Street in Brooklyn, where he boarded at a house where the publication The Brooklyn Eagle uh, would later be conceived. Later on, he would return to Southampton and worked uh, for a few years leading up to his interest in whaling, finally. Uh, and in 1830, at the age of 23, he sailed on his first whaling voyage, signing up for a three-year cruise before the mast uh, and told his friends he won't be back until he was in command of his own ship. During this time, he made steady advancement and finally rose to the position of commander of the good ship uh, Baird of Greenport, uh, with his most profitable voyage uh, being as mate of the ship Hudson of Sag Harbor, alongside Captain McCarson in command. Uh, the ship itself sailed home filled to capacity with 2,800 casks of oil stowed away, much of which was taken from uh, right whales um, from the northwest coast of America near what is now known as Fox Islands. Um, right whales, as they were known also as black whales, got their name as they were regarded as the right, as in correct, whales to hunt due to swimming very close to the shore and consisting of a richness in, in blubber, which meant they would float when dead. While he was out sailing, uh, he brought along he brought aboard a long, thin wooden box that contained the old charts that would guide him through the Straits of Magellan and into the whaling grounds of the South Pacific and into the Indian Seas, as they were known. Uh, these charters were later donated to the Sag Harbor Whaling Museum by Captain Sayer's granddaughter, Geneva Sayer, and great-grandson, Robert J. Sayer, uh, grandson of Emmett Sayer as well. Uh, they had first... They had... Um, these charters had their first showing in the harpoon room of the museum at uh, the Sag Harbor Whaling Museum uh, with the Sag Harbor Spyglass um, featured in an article relating to the donation to the museum stated that uh, future visitors were able to follow the voyage as if reading from a diary and detailed his first spotting of a whale out in the Indian Oceans. Uh, he found himself troubled with rheumatism, but nevertheless remained a pleasant man to be in conversation with. Uh, both him and his wife had four sons, uh, namely Emmett Francis, who later lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he was engaged with the Cambridge News and Real Estate uh, Advertiser, and Edward, um, who went out to live in California, uh, with their fourth son, Nathan, sadly dying very early on. Um, but they also, alongside them, had a daughter, Adeline, known as, in quotes, the Aunt Addie of Sag Harbor who lived to be over 100 years old. Now, moving on to William R. Post, uh, born 1806, and once again, unfortunately, no record of their date uh, was found. Uh, William Post himself bought the property on North Main Street where it belonged to his father-in-law, Captain James Parker, another esteemed uh, whaling captain in Southampton, uh, with his own grave in the North End burying ground in the company of his four wives that he had uh, during his lifetime. William Post himself was very prominent in Southampton where he served at various times as supervisor, Presbyterian church elder, and Sunday school supervisor, um, being very integral into the community. Um, he himself built uh, his home on the plot of land which he procured from his father-in-law um, and William Post himself being the grandfather of Henry P. Fordham. Moving on to George White, um, born in 1823 to, and died in 1893. White himself uh, worked as a cabin boy at a very young age with his own duties consisting of waiting on ship officers uh, for commands. Uh, later on in his life, George White would enter politics and served as a president of town trustees as a member of the Democratic Party. Uh, with his own naval adventures illustrating the heritage of the whaling industry in Southampton itself. At the age of 26 years, or after his, within his 26 year career sailing in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, uh, he of course had hunted whales um, and rose through the ranks of pilot to captain, and indeed on one voyage in which uh, the exact years of this voyage is unfortunately lost, he sailed uh, much further north than any American vessel had ever ventured, 
But unfortunately, as I say, the exact year of this voyage is unfortunately a lost time. Here we see a shot of uh, George's house um, as it was rendered during the time in which he lived, uh, at which point he purchased his father's homestead at the corner of Main Street and Jagger Lane, uh, settling into life as a farmer and political activist. Um, during his time, he was called upon seafaring skills to rescue ships uh, found offshore, even after he had settled in Southampton. Um, George himself was credited uh, with numerous daring rescues from shore, saving uh, many crew members from shipwrecked vessels while sailing aboard the bark, uh, otherwise known as a sailing ship of three or more masts uh, named Cadmus. Uh, White was also instrumental in defending the residents' rights to the beach, uh, voicing his demands for these rights to be preserved and becoming known as a protector of the village's natural beauty, um, a history of which still stretches up to the present day, of course. And he himself earned respect amongst even his most uh, vicious antagonists uh, during his life. Um, he, even with them, he had earned their respect in his death. Now, moving on to Hubert Anderson White, uh, born 1832 and passed away in 1918. Uh, Hubert Anderson White himself lived on Main Street in Southampton uh, and was himself the son of Captain Edward White of Stabonek and the brother of Captain Elias White. At a very young age, uh, he had a desire to follow the sea, uh, which led to, at the age of 18, him shipping out with Captain Henry Edwards on the, on the uh, vessel Nathaniel P. Talmage going around Cape Horner and up in up into the Arctic, returning home after about 43 months, as is recorded. He has many more. He of course had many more whaling voyages as he worked his way up to the ranks of captain. But unfortunately, uh, records of those specific voyages are rather scarce. Sadly, um, in 1861, he would then enlist in the Harris Light Cavalry uh, Company uh, Division. Uh, the second of which in New York, and within this he served as a private. Uh, he served as known as Private White for 11 months uh, before, unfortunately, being honorably discharged after being thrown from his horse and severely injured. In 1865 of September, he would then marry Sarah Elizabeth Post, who is the daughter of Captain George Post, uh, a photo of which we see uh, right here next to us. Um, I don't know because of the case of like where my, uh, my face and all of this will be appearing. I assume up in the upper right hand corner, but uh, suffice to say, I uh, don't want to obscure uh, the photo too much. Um, but we see before us uh, Hubert and his wife, Sarah, uh, residing in their home in the, po in, the, uh, ha in the post house, which I will get into very briefly. On to uh, the Hubert White's uh, post house itself. Uh, the post house in particular would be home to uh, both Hubert and Sarah, as seen here residing at a uh, post crossing, which is indicated here on the map, um, right here on the northern end of Main Street. Um, and this is one of the earliest uh, photographs of the house as it existed then. With an additional photo, uh, as we see here, uh, showing an interior shot of the post house featuring uh, from both left to right, uh, Albert Post on the left, Right next to him, uh, Sarah White, and then the other end of the table, uh, Captain Hubert White himself. In these two respective photos here, uh, starting with the right-hand picture, uh, Hubert is seen uh, on his catboat, the Nakomis, uh, while sailing on Peconic Bay. With the left-hand photo uh, showing his vessel from a distance as he's on board. During his lifetime, he made many more uh, whaling voyages, as uh, implied before. And he had spent 40 years of his life in total sailing the deep seas, sailing at least three times around the world where he finally had retired in the aftermath of these three voyages around the world itself. Now on to Captain Philetus Pearson, uh, born in 1801, um, but unfortunately, oh, we do have record of his date, I apologize, in 1801 uh, and died in 1897. So uh, himself was a, uh, he himself was a resident of South Main Street and also a whaling captain in residence of the Greek Revival House on South Main Street where he resided. His, uh, his daughter had married uh, Captain Jeter Rogers uh, where the couple made their own home 
Uh, he was the brother of James Pearson, who was also a whaling captain, uh, himself born in 1838, but unfortunately record of his death is unknown. In 1949, the Pearson House was made the home of the artist Fairfield Porter until his respective death in 1975. Uh, and as of 2018, the New York art dealer, uh, I apologize for pronunciation, Andrea Glimshay, Glimshay, I apologize, uh, had been purchased the house uh, some two years uh, previous to today. Now, onto a uh, rather anomalous uh, entry. Sorry. My apologies, I dropped uh, one of my sheets of notes here. The most anomalous uh, entry, or entries, I should say, are the case of the two Barney Greens, um, uh, who both, uh, both of their records indicate that there were two Captain Barney Greens who sailed out of Sag Harbor uh, pretty much within the same time period. Uh, but we start, of course, with Barney Rowley Green. Um, his own birth and death are unknown, and unfortunately, no photographic records uh, indicate his appearance or um, anything, sadly. Uh, but he himself came from a huge whaling family that intermarried with other whaling families uh, in the Southampton and Sag Harbor area. He himself was the son of Aaron and Ann Nickerson Green, and his family's sister married, or sorry, his father's sister then married uh, Captain Mercator Cooper. Um, at the age of eight, uh, Barney Rowley Green himself went on his first whaling voyage as a cabin boy with his brother-in-law, Captain Henry Edwards, on the whale ship Fanny. Um, they, this began his career on the waters covering at least uh, 30 years, uh, roughly, where he made somewhere near, somewhere between eight and 12 voyages, uh, sailing twice around the world, visiting every single ocean and called at every large port of note during his lifetime. Uh, he himself was very fond of pets and animals, uh, known for bringing home birds and mammals he'd found amongst the islands of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Um, in one of the most ludicrous accounts itself, uh, he once brought an emu from New Zealand, uh, even having one of his stewards uh, lead it along the streets of Southampton itself. Uh, during this voyage, he brought a private venture uh, as a matter of speculation, including two dogs, a mastiff, and a bulldog uh, to present the livestock several hundred bushels of potatoes, large casks of small fruit trees of all of different varieties. And on his last voyage, he was uh, unfortunately very badly injured when his boat was smashed and punctured by a whale, uh, falling upon the loggerhead itself of the ship, the loggerhead being known as the post on a whaling boat used to secure the harpoon rope. It was speculated that he would not even survive his injuries on the vessel, but miraculously he did, although afterwards uh, vowing to have never sailed again, uh, understandably so. Um, afterwards, he would marry uh, Elizabeth Eliza J. Hildreth, um, and in his retirement from sailing, he became uh, active in his community and built a large house on South Main Street, uh, where he took in numerous boarders. Now on to the second Barney Green. Um, himself born in 1835 and passing away in 1902. Barney Jane Green was actually the nephew of Barney Riley Green and also the brother of Captain Henry Green. Um, in his lifetime, he made two voyages between 1863 and 1868 um, and was also known as the first chief of Southampton's fire department in 1890. Uh, Charles A. Jagger has a personal account on the Green family, um, which noted that he was uh, that he was a well-known personage even after his whaling days were finally finished. Onto the Green's house on South Main Street, uh, this large house on Toilsome Lane in South Main Street, uh, one of the village's uh, most popular boarding houses in the early days of the resort, uh, can be seen in a color reproduction here. Uh, in this color reproduction, the greenhouse, uh, the Green's house, my apologies, is seen alongside Main Street uh, with one of its most Notable features being the striped awnings that you see adorned above most of the windows that we see, as well as the uh, rounded deck that you see uh, pretty much right in the, uh, the foreground of how the house is positioned in the shot. Now then, uh, after this long list of uh, whaling captains, um, what, follows, what followed in a, in a great many cases of these whaling captains was uh, they themselves are not content with simply uh, whaling as a profession as another um, prospect of enrichment and profit 
would then uh, become, would then just explode within their own lifetime, namely the gold rush of the 19th century. With the, uh, with the accompanying uh, picture right here, we see being the California gold rush advertisement uh, for the California Steam Navigation Company itself. So as soon as uh, news about gold in California reached Southampton, uh, a mass exodus of able-bodied men then began making their way westward, westward to make a fortune from this endeavor. Uh, between 1848 and 1854, there were at least 250 men from uh, Southampton itself reaching San Francisco. Uh, the gold rush itself was discovered in Coloma, California, about 130 miles just east of San Francisco. One of the key vessels uh, that would make its way towards San Francisco, which would uh, be accompanied by, at the very least, 18 other sea captains from Southampton, was known as the Sabina, uh, which was commanded by Captain Henry Green, uh, accompanied by numerous uh, sea captains coming out of Southampton and Sag Harbor, respectively. The Southampton California Mining and Trading Company themselves purchased the Sabina. However, the vessel was unfortunately very old and barely seaworthy. Um, it is said that without the presence of these, at the very least, 18 sea captains, these whalemen on board, its survival during the six-month voyage would not have been anticipated at all because of how poorly damaged it was. While the Sabina had successfully, albeit like strugglingly, made it to California, it had unfortunately could not make the return journey and was then later sold. And here we see um, a little bit more of a detailed shot of, or as detailed of a shot as was capable of being produced at the time of really all of the whaling vessels and all of the vessels itself that came to port in the San Francisco Bay circa 1849, once the news of this gold rush had broken and all of these whaling captains uh, wanted to try their hands. Now then, uh, many of the aforementioned whaling captains made their way westward, um, those in which I had discussed uh, within this lecture, um, and many of them wound up with varying degrees of success or failure. So just going in the order in which um, I had uh, talked about these whaling captains, uh, starting with Pierce Concer, um, in 1849, he himself sailed to California to hunt for gold, but unfortunately to no great success, and then of course returning back to Southampton to do to operate his uh, ferry, uh, his ferry business um, on Lake Agawam. Uh, Albert Rogers himself uh, was on board the Sabina as part of the mining and trading company, uh, but unfortunately, no records of how much he made uh, during this venture were able to be recorded or uh, maintained leading up to the present. Uh, Francis Sayer himself, uh, he was of course struck by gold fever when he was. 42 years old, uh, returning several years later, having been moderately successful in his quest for riches. Uh, James Parker himself spent his final two years in California in which he pursued the gold rush out west uh, as one of the prior owners of the Sabina itself, uh, which also resulted in William R. Post purchasing his old property as he made his way westward. Uh, George White himself uh, bought his own vessel, the ship Cadmus, and that sailed around Cape Horn and became a 49er, um, as it was known, returning with a gold nugget he fashioned into a wedding ring for his bride, Elizabeth Fordham, in 1852. Uh, Barney R. Green himself on board the Sabina as well, as it made its way to California. Um, afterwards, during the summer of 1850, he turned his attention from gold digging and accepted a position as master of the ship, uh, pronunciation, my apologies, Ducalion. Uh, coming out of Australia itself. It was during this time with the heavy lure of gold during the midpoint of the 19th century uh, that the whaling industry in Southampton took a major blow, uh, one, the first of uh, many, unfortunately, which led to its, uh, the whaling industry uh, dwindling as far as Southampton is concerned. Uh, with a combination of other factors culminating in the unrecoverable downturn um, in the industry locally, the gold rush was the first major factor in all of this. Now then, um, really expanding upon the uh, the downward turn of the whaling industry as far as Southampton is concerned, 
Um, the discovery of petroleum itself in 1859, uh, which was used as an alternative to whale blubber, uh, an alternative to whale blubber produced oil, which was popular leading up to that point. Um, its founding in Titusville, Pennsylvania, uh, led to mining for petroleum. Uh, it was seen as a safer and less a financial risk, uh, which caused many whalemen and financiers of their trips to change career paths entirely um, for those who were lured away from uh, whaling in terms of uh, gold uh, for the sake of profit uh, would no doubt have also been lured by the temptation of uh, mining for petroleum as it was uh, seen as a much more um, supposedly feasible and much more efficient uh, alternative to such. Uh, between 1835 and 1872, American whalers, um, it is recorded, killed up to at least 292,714 whales. Um, and as a result of the whales in the sea uh, lowering in terms of number, uh, journeys took even longer and longer and searches became much more thorough to find whales uh, since there were none as numerous as they once were. Once it was no longer profitable to hunt whales, the end was very close uh, the end was in sight pretty much as far as this industry was concerned. The development of the Industrial Revolution alongside all of this also saw people investing in factories uh, for the sake of profit rather than hunting whales, uh, which, it, which, to reiterate, became a very arduous process as time went on. So um, the most notable um, oh, before this, uh, between both the Industrial Revolution and the discovery of petroleum, the need for whaling saw its sharpest decline amongst Americans. Um, with the most notable final vessel to sail out of the local area, the Brig Myra sailing out of South, uh, sorry, sailing out of Sag Harbor, uh, went on a voyage that lasted about three years, returning later in 1874 and declared a wreck and completely broken up in Barbados. With the destruction of this vessel, uh, it marked essentially the end of a prosperous era in East in the East End and Southampton history. Um, later on, it would not be until 1973 when the U.S. Uh, Endangered Species Act was passed when American companies could no longer hunt whale. Um, this was, of course, a very American-centric law that was enacted uh, as other industries in other countries um, continue within their own right uh, their process of whaling. Uh, it should be uh, reiterated that uh, the whaling that took place in Southampton areas, the Southampton area before settlers arrived, Native American whaling was much more centered around survival and resource procurement uh, as opposed to a profitable industry venture that it would later become during the time of these respective captains uh, in their lifetimes. But of course, during this period of time in the 19th century, a great many men were recognized as such highly recognized whaling captains that Main Street was synonymous for the longest time with such captains in Southampton, thus given the name Captain's Row. So that concludes uh, my lecture. Um, going to turn off uh, screen sharing here. Uh, I believe I'm not sure if uh, oh, I don't. I don't believe uh, Connor is going to be turning on his microphone, of course. So I will then uh, transition to our Q and A section, in which, if you have any questions, I will, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, address them. I am. Oh, uh, I'm back as well. So I figure what we'll do is. Um, I will ask the questions pretending to be the audience here that was just watching Zach's lecture, um, and Zach will get a chance to uh, answer any of the questions you had. So um, we have a few questions, but if there are any other questions, please at this point uh, click the Q and A button down at the bottom and feel free to submit uh, any questions you might have. So uh, first, Zach, uh, we have a question asking uh, where is the North End Cemetery located? Okay, um, let me call upon my map, of course, because uh, I'm trying to remember right off the top of my head the specific uh, name of uh, what the street is now. Uh, just uh, I believe this is the cemetery that's located by the Stop and Shop, right? Uh, yes, that's the one. That would be the one where yeah, that is the one so, where Pierce Concert is buried. Yes, so that, that one is located up um, on uh, North Main Street. Um, if you know where Stop and Shop is today, um, it's right behind there. Uh, there's a gate that you can actually enter from, uh, I believe it's from on the North Main Street side. You can walk in there um, and go through and find Pierce Concert's grave, which is down at the far, uh, if you're walking in that direction, be at the far left-hand corner. Um, 
but there's also plenty of other tombstones in there and it's a it's a great old cemetery to look through um it truly is the second question we have here is uh what type of minister was herrick's son uh and they asked if he was unitarian um unfortunately i don't uh Throughout my uh, my record searching, I unfortunately could not find the specifics of what type of minister Herrick's uh, son was. So my apologies for that. Okay. Um, the next question we have is: the post house still there today? If I'm not mistaken, the post house uh, that's one of the areas that's been uh, was that was that one that was also uh, torn down and has been long since been. Uh, either reworked into an entirely different uh, facility, or is that still? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, my apologies. Okay. Um, um, we have another question of. Let's see. How many sailors accompanied the captains, and were they also from Southampton? Um, oh, I see. In the uh, the Q and A, the post office is still there. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I I think I was thinking of a different property that was. Uh, that had been uh, torn down and uh, the status of which was still up in the air. So my apologies for that. I appreciate that. Um, how many sailors accompanied the captains and were there, were they also uh, from Southampton? Um, again, the records that I was uh, looking at uh, really only focused on the captains uh, themselves as far as their own uh, personal lives and their own personal accounts on their ventures and stuff. Uh, any, any mention of the crew members um, was, rather scarce and as such um the number of sailors that accompanied the captains was also actually in a, in a select few cases i think there are some records of uh how many accompanying sailors there were on some of the most uh noted captains that were here um i believe well, also the, uh, the, number of, the number of sailors also often change depending on uh the needs of the boat so i mean earlier uh, whaling ventures when boats were smaller and they weren't going out as far, you would need far less men. Um, but as the journeys got longer and harder and the boats got bigger, uh, you would need far more sailors to take care of uh, all the needs. But generally speaking, on the whale boats that would be lowered from the ship out in the water to actually hunt the whales, there would be between four to eight men on the boat, depending on the size. Um, and then you would have potentially three to five, potentially more of those ships going out. So generally speaking, whale ships crews would be on the low end around 20 or so people. On the high end could probably be up anywhere to like 30 or 40 people. Um, Thank you very much for that. No problem. So let's see, next question we have here is, uh, did Pierce Concert own the company and boat that took people to the beach? So um, I can answer that question. Um, so uh, yeah, so Pierce Concert ran that company himself. Um, he, I believe his wife helped him out uh, with some of the uh, just sort of logistics of doing the, the uh, business. If you know where his house is today, it's right on Pond Lane, right on the uh, corner of Lake Agawam. Um, that's where the property was. There's a monument um, and a sign marker there uh, denotating where the, uh, where the property was. And Pierce Concert ran that business um, for a few years. And then after he passed away, I forget the man's name off the top of my head, but it is in my lecture. Uh, somebody took over the business uh, for at least the summer after he passed away to continue the uh, program going on. And uh, he not only took people across the water to the beach, but he also rented out uh, kayaks and uh, canoes like for people to um, go around on the water on their own. I believe it was 10 cents for a half an hour, 25 cents for an hour, or, or half a day, I think, for, for 25 cents. Then we have, let's see, next question. Uh, besides the Rogers Mansion, which other captain's houses are still in existence today? Um, let's see. Uh, one of the... Let me go through my notes uh, here once again. Um, <laughs> apologies. As I was just working through uh, all of the sheets here, I basically just like, uh, essentially just tossed them out of the way. So a few of these are a little out of order. I apologize for that. Um, it was the uh, one of the uh, I believe Barney J Green's uh, house still exists uh, today, does it? Not certain. Um, I do know that Edward D Sayers' house uh, is still around today. That is right on South Main Street. If you are uh, heading down South Main Street from Main Street, uh, you go right past the Presbyterian Church, and it's maybe about 
30 seconds down um, on the right hand side. Um, it has one of those uh, New York State markers out front, the big blue, uh, it's a black pole with a big blue sign on the front. There's a few of those up and down Main Street. Um, I know specifically everybody Sarah's house there because I made the sign and had it installed. Uh, but as for the other ones, I don't know off the top of my head. But uh, Zach, are you aware of any of the ones you talked about today um, still being around? Um, let's see. Well, this, uh, as you say, the um, I think the the Herrick House, um, the Herrick House, I believe, is uh, still in existence as well as uh, the Herrick's Hardware Store that is uh, descendants later on had uh, pioneered. That still exists, albeit with some uh, rebranding over the years. Um, the White House uh, still exists, and I believe the Post House uh, is still in existence today. Um, the White House you mentioned, that's George White's house, correct? Um, George White? Is that the one you're talking about? I think it's George White, yeah. It's either George or uh, Hubert White, um, yeah. one of the two Whites, of course. I'll say, I believe that's the one that's right on North Main Street, right by where the cemetery is, right by uh, sort of oh, yes. shop in that whole area right there. Um, yeah, effectively uh, just across the street um, from where Stop and Shop in the cemetery is. Yeah, that was actually given to the museum. Um, I, I believe about 10 years ago or a little over 10 years ago, um, the Southampton History Museum actually owned that property for a short amount of time. Um, eventually sold it um, and it's now privately owned and uh, they did a big reconstruction job. But from what I understand, they did a pretty good job at um, keeping it historical. I mean, if you drive by it today, it looks very similar to the Rogers Mansion and its architecture. They didn't really change the outside too much, though I imagine they have probably good internet and things like that inside. Oh yeah. Um, so let's see, let's go down, we have a few more questions. Um, how wealthy were the captains and did they interact with New York City society? Um, that is a tough question because uh, not only like while I was pouring through the records of uh, what captains uh, would then venture out to the gold rush out uh, west into uh, San Francisco, um, record of exactly like how wealthy they were um, during this venture itself were a little shaky and a lot of the times were not very often honestly we're not like recorded as far as like like by the numbers like fi finance uh, we can only like uh what is it infer exactly how wealthy they were on um, both uh with their what is it their gold rush ventures and also with uh their whaling expeditions as well um uh, suffice to say it's a matter of um where they saw themselves in the aftermath of uh whaling and then gold mining and such as uh really the best indicator of like how exactly how wealthy they were. Um, I believe it was uh, George White himself was fairly successful uh, out West um, while at the same time, Pierce Concerts, um, uh, his, uh, his gains came primarily from uh, his uh, ferry service uh, that he was running until his uh, retirement. Yeah, so when it, when it comes to the wealth of the captains, um not the captains weren't always the wealthiest so when it came to making money on whaling ventures it was always whoever owned the whale ship itself um and sometimes beyond that the whaling company so there might be a company that owns several ships and you would almost rent it out or lease it out to a captain um if a captain didn't actually own the boat themselves um and then they'd hire all their crew and everybody got paid percentages of what they made so you know if you're just a regular crewman you might only be getting a half a percent or so of the actual take from everything. Then maybe the captain is getting something like 30% and then the company that actually owns it is getting the large, large sum of it. So um, to, unless the captain himself owned the ship, they weren't getting that much. But in the grand scheme of things, they were still making um, a lot of, a lot of money for what, uh, for what we would account for today. So I would almost venture to guess in today's terms, you could think about it like if you own the whaling company, company you're a billionaire. If you own the whaling ship, you're the millionaire. Um, if you were maybe high ranking on the ship, you'd be upper middle class. And if you're if you're not any of a high rank on the boat, you're probably middle class or lower class or or just really struggling. Um, and a lot of times, people actually had to pay money to get onto the ship because they had to buy a lot of supplies, they had to pay for their lodging and things like that. And they oftentimes didn't make enough money to pay back the captain for the loan they were given to get onto the ship. So then they had to go on another one to pay off that. And sometimes we get caught up in this sort of indentured servitude uh, to the whaling captains. Um, as far as the interaction with New York City society, um, 
I, I had no idea, but I, I would speculate that in the later years, as New York City society became higher crust and, and wealthy, um, the people from out here would probably interact fairly well, um, but sometimes maybe a little difficult, given that the whaling captains were out to sea for years at a time and might only be home for a few months. Uh, they might not have so much time to go around to all these New York City parties that might be occurring. That is very true. Um, it wouldn't be until the, uh, the later part of the 19th century in which uh, New York City society would then like um, basically come flooding into Southampton uh, during what I guess we would call the Gilded Age out here. Um, and yes. like you say, a lot of the cases of the, of the whaling captains that I discussed here, um, they were for the most part like either out at seas um, or they were settled back in Southampton, uh, basically becoming prestigious out here outside of their whaling ventures, uh, doing numerous other uh, occupations as well. So um, really, except for this case of um, the whaling captain that would uh, be boarded at the same house in Brooklyn that started the Brooklyn Eagle, that's about as close as I can get to uh, records that I was able to uncover um, as far as their interactions with uh, what is close to the New York City area. Yeah. So the next going down the list, we have someone clarifying. So the, some of the houses that are still around today would be uh, the Herrick House, the Post House, and the White House are all still uh, up and around today. I think we, we covered most of those as we were talking it through. Um, and then the final question we have here is, why didn't more of the captains just live in Sag Harbor, closer to their shipping activities? Um, it comes down to, I think, just a matter of uh, where a lot of their family uh, existed and where indeed they were able to procure uh, property. Like in some of the cases of the whaling captains, they either, um, what is it, either they inherited or they indeed uh, purchased the property from uh, their either direct or indirect family members. And as such, they also had just like generations of uh, family also living there in the Southampton area. Um, what is it, the, the Herricks, the Halsey, the Howells, uh, the Rogers, of course. Um, and as far as uh, the Sag Harbor is uh, concerned, uh, that was more primarily a, uh, a shipping port area. And as such, um, just imagining like all of the cacophony, all of the noise, all of the uh, just everything going on as far as like that being a major port. Um, uh, I would I would assume that a lot of uh, captains would not want to be uh, as close to that as possible um, while they're in their own uh, resident area. Uh, but again, it also comes down to uh, really like the the clearest point is just like as far as space in Southampton is concerned um, and availability of uh, housing and property and also just like family relations and where they already like had families and had relatives and loved ones uh, that were they were already uh, living with or indeed had prospects for living with. Um, in the case of some of the captains coming out uh, back from just months upon years of uh, ventures out in the seas uh, where they had prospects of settling um, and indeed who they wanted to plan on marrying when they came back. Also, um, in this talk, Zach was mostly talking about the Southampton captains. So, I mean, there were captains that did live in other towns. Uh, There's plenty of captains that lived maybe uh, further west, out towards West Hampton area. There was captains that lived on the North Fork. Um, and there was captains that lived in East Hampton, Sag Harbor, Bridgehampton, Montauk, uh, all over. So, um, like Zach was saying, these captains, uh, they talked about for pri primarily uh, had large familial ties to Southampton area. So this is just where they lived. Um, and there was plenty of captains that lived out in Sag Harbor. Um, and by the, you know, the mid 1800s, which is the time period we were really talking about, um, people had had their locations sort of settled. So there wasn't that, a lot of room probably in the main street area of Sag Harbor to, to live. Um, and, you know, it'd be probably pretty nice, like Zach was saying, to live outside of all the hustle and bustle of Sag Harbor, which would have been an extraordinarily busy and bustling town um, with all the whaling uh, ships going in and out of it, things like that. Um, and also plenty of these captains, um, they didn't always just sail out of Sag Harbor. Sometimes they'd sail out of other ports on Long Island. So they might live in Southampton, but they might leave from Greenport or Oyster Bay. They might even leave from Connecticut in some, uh, some instances. So, um, but, but these captains, they all lived here primarily, I would say, familial ties, like Zach was saying. Um, so let's see, do we have Indeed. any other questions? If not, I believe that was the last one. Um, I guess we will call an end to this program. Um, thank you to everybody that joined us today. Um, the next lecture uh, that will be hosted by the Southampton History Museum will be um, on the Southampton Hospital uh, by our research center manager, Mary Cummings. She wrote a book um, on the hospital, which I have right here. Um, 
Of course, it's disappearing. I got to hold it close to my face. <laughs> um, we're going to be putting this book on our website. It's called 100 Years of Healing, Southampton Hospital, 1909 to 2009. Um, that was done for an exhibit that the museum did about 10 years ago, talking about the centennial of the hospital um, and everything that's gone on there from its founding, starting with a surgery that had to be emergency done in an attic up to today, which, where it's owned by Stony Brook Hospital. And it's one of the probably best hospitals in the area. Um, so we'll be going over that next week, same place, same time. Um, and thank everybody for coming today and we'll see you later. Thank you so much, everybody.